Welcome to the screencast for A Defense of Abortion by Judith Jarvis Thompson. So with this lecture, we're starting a new unit. We've looked at theoretical conceptions of what morality is or what moral systems we should accept. And in this unit, we're going to focus on actual difficulties that philosophers have tackled and formed arguments about. This article starts on page 393 in our textbooks. So at the beginning of Jarvis Thompson's article and in the introduction from Stephen Kahn, one of the standard formulations of an argument against abortion is laid out. Remember that a standard form of an argument is a logical construct that tries to capture all of the important premises and the conclusion in the most simple possible manner, just so we can clearly see the evidence leading up to the conclusion. And of course, there are a lot more details in people's real world arguments against abortion, but some of the core premises and conclusions are listed here. And note that this is a deductive argument. Remember that in deductive arguments, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. It's just the structure of the argument locks in the conclusion. So the only way to argue against a deductive argument is to reject one or more of the premises. Now let's take a look at this standard form of the argument against abortion. Premise one, a fetus is an innocent human being. Premise two, Killing an innocent human being is always wrong, which leads to the conclusion three. Therefore, killing a fetus is always wrong. A lot of people who argue against this focus on number one. They say that a fetus is not a human being from conception, and there's some line in the sand where in a fetus turns into a human being. And that line in the sand has changed a lot over time. Some people have argued that it's not until the fetus is born that it becomes a human being. Some people say, or they used to say, the quickening, which is an old fashioned term for when the baby started to kick, when the heart starts beating, or when some other of the senses starts functioning. So there are various places in which people have said the fetus starts to be a person. Uh, Jarvis Thompson will talk about this a little bit, only for a couple of pages, but maybe surprisingly, she's going to focus more on number two, trying to provide counter arguments to the idea that killing an innocent human being is always wrong. So when she talks about the first premise, she notes that picking a spot in gestation where a fetus turns into a human being falls into the fallacy of the slippery slope. Sometimes this fallacy is also called the domino fallacy. And it occurs when someone says event A will eventually cause event X, even though events B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. have to happen in between. If you were going to be uh, logically accurate, in arguing that A would eventually call X, you would have to provide an argument with evidence for every step, every single step along the way. A will cause B because of this. B will cause C because of this. And uh, when you commit the fallacy, you don't provide the in-between arguments. And we've encountered these kinds of arguments a lot in the real world whether it was for gay marriage or communism in Vietnam. Um, and Jarvis Thompson says, okay, picking a random spot in gestation to say this is when a fetus becomes a human being is a slippery slope because it can move anywhere along uh, the developmental chain. And it can be really difficult objectively to decide which evidence counts more than other evidence. 
So provisionally, she accepts for her argument the idea that the fetus becomes a human being at conception. She doesn't really think that uh, the blastocyst counts as a human being, but sometimes when you want to make a logical point, say focusing on premise number two instead of premise number one, you can concede to your opponent one of their points and attack a different one. So she does note that a fetus probably becomes a human person, whatever the definition of that ends up being yeah, before birth, but with the knowledge we currently have, we don't know when. So it seems like if we concede this to our opponents or her opponents, uh, that the fetus is a human being at conception, it seems like we've lost the argument that abortion is ever permissible. But Jarvis Thompson disagrees. She expands the second premise a little bit to give it a little bit more detail when she says that uh, killing an innocent person is always wrong because everybody has a right to life. So if a fetus is a person, the fetus has a right to life as well. People have bodily autonomy, which means they have control over what happens to, around, and in their body. So the mother, of course, has this. Yet the right to life is a stronger or more important right than bodily autonomy. So the fetus should not be terminated under any circumstances. Remember, this is the expanded premise, too, of the argument against abortion. But to combat this, Jarvis Thompson gives us a thought experiment. She says, imagine that you wake up in a hospital bed. You weren't in the hospital the day before. There are tubes connecting you to a famous violinist, uh, a famous, talented, world-renowned violinist whose talents are unmatched by anybody else. So someone pretty special. And the violinist has a kidney ailment. And the Society for Music Lovers have scoured the earth high and low, but you are the only perfect match for this violinist. So the system of tubes recycles blood through your kidneys and then back to the violinist. And if you were unhooked, the famous violinist would die. So the team of doctors comes to you and said that they're appalled, and if the Society of Music Lovers hadn't lied to them about your consent, they would have never hooked you up. But the fact is, you're hooked up, and if you unhook yourself, the violinist will die. So what if you had to lay there for nine months, or even longer, nine years? or the rest of your life. Are you morally obligated to stay in that hospital room and keep the violinist alive? And another way to put that is, does you, the right to life of the violinist outweigh your bodily autonomy? And in what circumstance does it do that? Travis Thompson says, well, you might object that this is an exceptional case because you didn't consent. You were kidnapped and you woke up in this situation. So it's an unusual case because uh, it might be more analogous to rape. A lot of people choose to have sex uh, and that can be a different story, which she will consider a little bit later in the article. And Jarvis Thompson points out that sometimes anti-abortion activists allow exceptions in cases of rape, incest, or the health of the mother. Uh, she also notes that sometimes pregnancies are difficult, as in when women are bedbound for months at a time, which takes away a lot of their bodily autonomy and robust health. There are, though, those who make no exceptions whatsoever. They're increasingly rare in uh, our world, but there are still some people that say abortion is always impermissible. Jarvis Thompson calls this the extreme view, and it's the one that she analyzes first.
she says that this view is not justified only by that deductive argument that we saw in the beginning. Uh, because when the mother's life is at risk, both people in the situation have the right to life. The fetus that we've conceded as a human and the mother. So if they both have an equal right to life, how do we decide which one to save if both of their lives are at risk? And the author here says that those who hold the extreme view that abortion is never okay need further premises or justifications to hold up their argument in this case. So sometimes they add this premise. If you perform an abortion, you're actively killing, while if you allow the pregnancy to continue, you're only passively letting someone die. So actively killing something that is a person is more morally repugnant than allowing death. And the counter argument that Jarvis Thompson makes to this is it's not murder when you kill to save your own life. So the mother might not want to kill the fetus or the child, but she also might value her own life because it's one of the most valuable assets human beings have. Um, imagine back in the violinist experiment, if the doctor came to you after a few weeks and said, the strain on your kidneys was a lot more than they had thought, and if you stay hooked up, you're going to die within a few weeks or a month. Does that change your idea of whether or not you should stay hooked up to the violinist? Most people would say yes, if you decided to stay in the first place. If you're going to die when you stay hooked in, even if the violinist will die when you unhook yourself, you have the right to your own life. She has a couple other examples, but since this one is going to be a little bit of a long one, I'll leave those to you, checking them out in the textbook. Uh, moving on to the next part, though, is sometimes in the arguments against abortion, uh, the obligations of the third party are what are focused on. So not the mother, not the fetus, but the person who is performing the abortion. What moral obligations do they have when it comes to deciding whether or not to end the fetus's life? Travis Thompson first says we should probably not worry about them too much in the sense where we should focus more on the mother because it's her bo bodily autonomy that's at stake and it's her personhood that is important to deciding whether or not it's okay to terminate the life of the fetus. And if you get to the point where the third party shouldn't act, it doesn't say anything about whether or not the mother should end the fetus's life to protect her own. But Jarvis Thompson says that it even casts doubt on the idea that the third party can be impartial whatsoever. So we think about the third party, the doctor, as weighing the fetus's life uh, equally with the mother's life. Uh, but uh, she gives an analogy to say why it's pretty difficult to remain impartial in this instance, to say that they're absolutely equal. She says the mother's body is sort of like a house. She owns the house. She's housing the fetus. So the ownership of the independent body in the scenario with the dependent goes to the mother. Uh, the analogy is there are two people. It's the middle of winter, Smith and Jones. Those are, I think, the favorite names for philosophical thought experiments. Jones owns a coat, Smith steals it because he's cold and he needs it, but it's Jones's coat. Uh, Jones has ownership of the property, and even though they both need it, it should probably go to Jones. So Jarvis Thompson thinks she's pretty resoundly demonstrated that if the mother's life is at stake, there's no question that 
abortion is morally permissible. But what about in all of the cases where the mother's life is not at stake? On page 398, she says, the argument treats the right to life as if it were unproblematic. It is not. Uh, and it seems to me precisely to be the source of the mistake. So what could she mean here? Keep in mind, there'll be a little hint for what the arguments are aiming at. Sometimes people's rights conflict. Uh, and that makes deciding what to do in the protection of people's rights difficult right, in a lot of complicated ways. So first she asks what it is to have the right to life. Uh, first, of course, there's a bare minimum everybody needs to keep living. Oxygen, food, water. Okay. But it's not a constant over all humanity. There are people who are sick that need insulin or um, di a kidney dialysis, uh, medication, care if they happen to be disabled. Um, and Jarvis Thompson says, if I need something from someone else in order to continue living, uh, it's not something that I have a right to. It'd be nice if they gave it to me, but I don't have a right to it. So you can think of this as maybe you need a new organ. Uh, I need it to keep living. I might need a new kidney, but I have no right to go find a donor that matches me and force them to give me one of their kidneys. Her example is even more trivial. She says, Paul Newman, and if you don't know him, or no, it's Henry Fonda, both actors several decades before any of you were likely born. But, uh, okay, imagine you have an illness and you're going to die unless Henry Fonda comes and touches you on the forehead. It seems like a trivial thing, but you're still not owed it because Henry Fonda has his own bodily autonomy and it would be nice of him to fly across the country or even listen to you when you showed up on his doorstep, but he doesn't have to. Um, think back to the violinist. It's the same thing. You're not required to stay hooked up because you have your own bodily autonomy, but it would be morally praiseworthy of you if you donated your time and bodily resources. So another view of what the right to life is, is uh, the right not to be killed. So that's a negative argument. It's a passive argument. All people have when they have the right to life is the right not to be killed by another person. So that means, though, if you take it to the logical extreme, that if you're already hooked up to the violinist, uh, you're forced to stay at the violinist. That's counterintuitive to most people. It, because he has the right to not be killed by you, and you are in this, the particular circumstance wherein, if you unhooked yourself, you'd, you'd be killing him. Obviously, this is analogous to the case when abortion is considered. Uh, okay, so the new argument is that instead of just the right not to be killed, you have the right to not be killed unjustly. So what does that mean? It's not unjust if you unhook yourself from the violinist because you have a right to your own body and bodily autonomy about what happens in, around, and to your body. But what counts as unjust killing when it's applied to pregnancy? Because if you voluntarily have sex, you have at least a partial responsibility, causally. We're not even talking about morally. You have a causally responsible uh, place in creating the fetus. But then if you think about this, even when the mother's life is at, at risk, she's still causally responsible for that life, which might make the abortion unjust, even in the case 
that the mother's life is threatened. On page 401, Jarvis Thompson talks of, asks the question of if voluntary sex counts in all cases for uh, giving the fetus rights to depend on the mother's body and resources. Uh, she gives a couple of examples. She says, uh, and you may think they're stronger or weaker examples, but try and get, again, the logical point she's making, not necessarily the plausibility of the examples. She says, it's a hot day, you don't have air conditioning, so you open all your doors and windows, and a burglar comes in. Uh, and you say, oh, now, now he can stay. She's given him a right to use her house because she opened the doors and windows. She's partially responsible because she didn't lock all of her doors and windows. Now, nobody would say that. <laughs> nobody would say, uh, everybody knows they're burglars and burglars burgle, so it's her fault that she got robbed. There's another extended example, and again this is on page 401, the second full paragraph. Suppose it were like this, and she means getting pregnant. Uh, people's seeds drift about the air like pollen, and if you open your windows, one might drift in and take root in your carpets or upholstery. You don't want children, so you fix up your windows with a fine mesh screen, the very best you can buy. As it can happen, however, on very, very rare occasions, uh, one of the screens is defective and a seed drifts in and takes root. Does the person plant who now develops have a right to use you or your house? So this is obviously analogous to someone who doesn't want to get pregnant, uses contraception and is careful, but uh, the birth control fails and the woman becomes pregnant. So has the mother given permission? for the fetus to use her body and resources in that instance. And Jarvis Thompson concludes that these examples show that some cases the fetus has a right to the mother's body and resources. In some cases, it's not as clear. It's not as straightforward. Then she says, well, okay, what about if the violinist only needs one hour of your kidneys or a minute? She says that it would be morally indecent to refuse, but you still have the right to your body, so you could refuse. So it wouldn't be unjust. It would just be callous and greedy and stingy. It's still just to assert your right to have bodily autonomy but it would be indecent to refuse when it is not, uh, there's no sort of heavy demand on your time or resources. Um, but the relative easiness or hardness can never be the metric by which people are owed the resources of others. On page 403, Jarvis Thompson gives the story of a good Samaritan that comes from the Bible. Um, I'll paraphrase it. A lot of you have probably heard it before. Um, a man was robbed on the streets between Jerusalem and Jericho, and they took everything, his food, water, clothing even. And priests came by, and Levite came by, which is another group of people, and they just passed by this man who is suffering. But then came the Good Samaritan who fixed his wounds and carried him to a hotel and paid for his stay there and paid for a doctor. Obviously, they're Good Samaritans, but what about minimally decent Samaritans? Where if something is not a lot of, not resource intensive for you, uh, it might not be a moral obligation for you to do the, th the thing that doesn't take resources, but it is the morally, minimally decent thing to do. Another argument you, that's encountered in the abortion debate is that 
the fetus isn't just any person with a right to life, but a person toward whom the mother has a special responsibility because she has a biological connection to the fetus. Travis Thompson says on page 404, surely we do not have any such special responsibility for a person unless we've assumed it. And by it, she means the responsibility. Explicitly or implicitly. If a set of parents don't try to prevent pregnancy, do not obtain an abortion, at the time of the birth, do not put the child up for adoption, but rather take it home, then they have assumed responsibility for it and given it rights. And now you can't just withdraw your support from it at that point. But if you take precautions, Jarvis Thompson says biological relatedness does not impose special responsibility. Okay, so the conclusions. I know this one's been a little bit long, but it's very detailed, uh, a lot like the abortion debate is. So here are some summing up of the most important points. One. This argument concludes that abortions are sometimes morally permissible, but not always. She does have a little story in there about frivolous abortions, wherein the reasons to have it do not outweigh the right to life, like you wanted to be slim for a vacation. Um, so sometimes morally permissible, but not always. And she notes how that angers both camps, probably sometimes. Um, the second major conclusion is that uh, the, the idea that abortion is morally permissible sometimes does not give you the right to secure the death of the unborn child. So what she means by that is if the mother decides to have an abortion but the abortion fails for whatever reason and the child is still born, that doesn't give her the right to kill the child. Uh, and she said, of course, always remember that we've only accepted premise number one, that the fetus is a person from conception for the purposes of this argument. And she says a very early abortion doesn't even really need the arguments from this paper. A blastocyst is nothing like a person. So when you think about your response to this paper and the next one, like actually, I want you to keep in mind a couple of things. First, the arguments from the thought experiment with the violinist and how it relates to abortion in the cases of rape, the health of the mother, and when the mother's uh, health is not at risk. Number or D, letter D, excuse me, has several sub arguments which include different definitions for the right to life and the idea of what we owe to one another versus what would be morally decent to give to one another. So in there I've outlined all of the important sections of the argument and you can think about it that way when I ask you to respond to this in the assignment.